Hey everyone, before we get started with this week's episode, I want to tell you about another podcast that I've been listening to that I think you guys will enjoy. I know a lot of people listening to my podcast work in healthcare in some way, and if you do, then you're probably like me and hardcore judge the accuracy of anything in movies or TV that has to do with the medical field. You know, you sit there and you scream at the TV as they try and intubate with a young cow or suction catheter. Where would you even put the capnography, Susan? Come on, people. We all know Hollywood loves to over-dramatize mental health conditions, but I'm not a psychiatrist or a therapist, so sometimes I find myself thinking, I know that's not quite right, but how far off are they? Well, that's where the podcast Pop Psych 101 comes in. Pop Psych 101 is hosted by two guys, Mike and Ryan, and every week they talk about a different movie and which mental health disorders are depicted, for better or worse. Ryan is an actual licensed therapist, and he gives us that evidence-based breakdown we crave. It's a fun podcast about movies with an intellectual analysis that helps fight misconceptions about mental health. So if you are someone that screams, you don't shock a sisterly at the TV, you will love Pop Psych 101. Plus, Mike made that absolutely amazing trailer video for our Do What You Can episode that I shared on Facebook. So go show them some love and take a listen wherever you download podcasts. On with the show. Welcome to another episode of Antidotes. This week, we have another international guest after everyone loved last time when we had Haley on telling us about medicine from the other side of the world. This time, we have Allison. And Allison, tell everyone where you're from. I'm from Brisbane, Australia. We are recording this Monday night at 7 o'clock for me. And it is... Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. And two seasons ahead. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, or behind, not ahead. Yeah, so we're just coming into a oh, beautiful spring weather. I'd tell you what the temperature is, but you won't understand it. It's about 19 degrees Celsius, so whatever that is in Fahrenheit, it's beautiful. 66 Fahrenheit. Oh, that sounds lovely. It's beautiful. So we are going into like fall, and I never had allergies until I moved down to DC. I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't understand what it was, and now. All of a sudden, like my face swells up. It's really terrible. Like the spring, I'm totally fine, but ragweed is just my absolute enemy. (laughs) So I went to work today after having taken Benadryl to sleep because I was just sneezing and I couldn't function. And I think between the Benadryl hangover and having bright red eyes and a puffy face, I think all of my patients were convinced that I was stoned (laughs) because I was just so out of it. So happy fall to the Northern Hemisphere. I can't believe how many people suffer from allergies from um, our Facebook group that we have in common. There were so many people with streaming eyes and stuffy noses. And yeah, I thought that was a spring thing. Yeah, I guess it's a regional thing. I did not really believe in the allergies until I, I moved. I was like, what is this nonsense? And then... It's worse after I exercised, which I'm I'm guessing like the physiology behind it is like you're breathing yeah. it deeper and your pores are dilating and there's more circulation to the surface or something. But I've got a cure for that. Don't exercise. <laughs> yeah, stop exercising. <laughs> I know, right? Doctor's <laughs> orders. <laughs> Nurse practitioner's orders. So I feel like I should give a shout out to some of the podcast listeners because I'm a terrible podcast host. Oh, I, I haven't introduced myself yet either. I'm Christine. I'm the host of Antidote Stories in Medicine. Thank you for turning back in to another week. It's bit, it's Monday for me. It's been a long Monday. I'm drinking wine. It's been a long week <laughs> already. Already. It, last week last week was a long week. It was kind of shit on Christine week at work. So from patients, we were going to record last week, and it it did not happen because of uh, technical issues my end, and you'd had enough of the week your end. Yeah, <laughs> that was and that was on Wednesday. <laughs> Yeah, we're starting off right. So usually what happens when I do the podcast is I record with guests ahead of time and then I release the episodes because it's kind of hard to get people scheduled and stuff and it's all it's based on their schedule. So I don't ever like in real time like say hi to listeners and thank them like I should. Um, so I guess I should give some shout outs. Speaking of international, uh, international for me and as an American, 
Australia is like really representing. We have a couple of people there. So thank you, Alison, for starting that wave off. My pleasure. We just had some people in Kazakhstan. Wow. We had one. Oh, we had one that's person. still amazing. I know. I thought that was crazy. Two downloads in Iran. One of them was the Saudi Arabia episode, which mm. was cool. Mm. That was confronting, that episode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brazil. And but like, these are all like one episode, two episodes. So you're like, oh, that's cool. It's just like on the map because there's like a little map I can see. But I can tell like there's the number of downloads based on the actual number of episodes. Like you can tell there's one listener in one country. So I feel like I need to shout out those one listeners that I have in each of these random countries or each of these countries that are not the United States. So what's up, Sweden, Germany, Spain? Thank you guys for listening. And we have a couple of Canadian listeners. And then it's several in the UK, Australia, Korea, and Japan. So you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for listening. Talking to a healthcare worker in Kazakhstan would be a win, wouldn't it? That would be so fascinating. I think it's just so cool talking to anybody anywhere. But the more diverse experiences <laughs> that we can talk about, the better. So tell me a little bit yeah. about your experiences. You've been a nurse for 30 years in Australia. Yeah, so I straight out of school went into nursing and that was back in the days when you got paid to be a student nurse, so hospital trained nursing and that was phased out within a few years after I started. But it was a real it was a, an amazing experience. 3 years getting paid to do it, learning so much, you know, I just had so much clinical exposure, you know, compared to the students that come through now. In those 3 years I did he was looking after trackies straight away. I was, did, you know, neuro, neurology, neurosurgery, maxillofacial, urology, orthopedics, eyes, throats, you know, everything. That's so cool. We had such a broad experience and we hit the ground running. You know, once you, once you uh, became an RN, that was it. You know, you knew, you knew what you were doing, whereas people coming out now, they need their hands held for a little bit longer, I feel like. But they still get there eventually. Did you start clinicals right away? Was there a didactic portion? Yeah, there was two months, I think, of just lectures. So again, getting paid to be lectured at, which is just amazing when I think about it now. Yeah, I know all the American nurses would be absolutely, completely jealous. Even Australian nurses, you know, student nurses now, they're, you know, paying to go to university and they have to go and do their clinical placements for 12 hours a day Yep, and fit in jobs and study and family life in amongst that. So it's really, really hard for them, I think. Was it easy to find a job out of school when you graduated? Uh, when I graduated nursing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There were jobs everywhere. I don't think, I can't think of anyone that couldn't get a job after we finished our training. I know one person that didn't get a job because she didn't want to. She realised that she'd wasted three years of her life and hated it. But <laughs> That anyone that wanted a job in nursing got it. And that, yeah, that's another problem that students here in Australia are having now is uh, paying all that money for a, uh, to get their degree and not being able to get a job. Yeah. And then, you know, you've spent all that money and you, or, or I think a lot of them are going straight into nursing homes if they can't get a job in a hospital. So they've got very little experience and they might be the only RN working in aged, aged care. Sorry, nursing home. Is that, do you know what I mean by a nursing home? Oh, yeah, we use nursing home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we've got these inexperienced uh, nurses looking after our most vulnerable people in society, you know. It's, it's very scary. Yeah, and they're usually the most complex patients too. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I understand why we moved to that model of a degree in nursing, but uh, I think we lost a lot by getting rid of the hospital-based program. Mm. Yeah, and it was fun. It was fun. You know, we a lot of us lived in the nurses' quarters and you really were in each other's pockets and you really, you <laughs> know, forged in the by fire. It was a wonderful experience. But I, there's a lot of things about nursing that have changed in that time for the better. Like the wards that we were working in then, they were ancient and just insects, you know, cockroaches climbing in the windows and, you know, no air conditioning. So, you know, just boiling hot in summer. Oh, yeah and freezing cold in winter and, and nurses smoking at the nurses station you know it's really terrible <laughs> you, can't, you can't you just can't believe how much we've changed but mostly for the better I can remember like this one guy had a tracky and he, you know you had the inner cannula that you change mm -hmm. and we'd just leave it in a cup next to the bed and I can remember coming in on a night shift with my torch and seeing this 
cockroach uh, climbing around the khaki insert. Oh, it's just so gross. Oh, no. What did you do? Like, get a new one? Oh, no, we probably didn't have a new one. I think we used to keep it in a bath of, like, chlorhexidine, so I probably just, just cleaned it. I don't think we would have been able to find a new one at that time of night. I don't know, a long time ago. Yeah. But thankfully all those old wards have been down long ago now. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So what was your first job out of nursing school? Um, I worked at a orthopedic ward at a different hospital to where I did my training, but yeah, I just did that for a year. And then I was, you know, I was just doing that for as long as it took for me to save up enough money to travel around the world. And that's another thing about nursing is it's such a great job for travel. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so then I went to um, the UK and worked there, but not as a registered nurse. I couldn't quite get myself together to get um, registered there. I would have had to have done some extra midwifery training, which I didn't have any in my in my nursing training. So I just cared for people in the home when I lived there, which was good fun. So like as a live-in nurse for two weeks at a time, looking up, you know, just looking after usually elderly people. I I really enjoyed it. Got to Mm -hmm. see little bits of England that I wouldn't have seen otherwise, meet people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. Yeah, that's a cool way to experience the culture of a place. Absolutely, yeah. I'd love to go back and do it again if they'd have me when my (laughs) children have left home. Yeah, it was really good. I was very young at the time, of course, you know, I was only 20, 21, and I was very irresponsible also (laughs) so I think I could go back and do a better job there was this I was looking after this old lady and she was cranky old bird and she started (laughs) she started going on about in in a really insulting way about black people you know she was just oh the country is so much worse off than we should they should never live here and everything I was like oh you old bitch I just I was just so angry with her that, yeah, that night after she'd gone to bed, I just went out. (laughs) I shouldn't have. It was very bad. You know, I was supposed to stay there 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I had some friends that were having a get together. So I just went and joined them at the party and then came back at five o'clock in the morning. (laughs) So I was very irresponsible, but I felt like she deserved it. (laughs) Racist old bird. (laughs) Yeah. So um, the the only other place I worked as a nurse was in New Zealand. I worked there also for a little while. Is their health system different than Australia's or is it similar? No, I'd say very, very similar. In fact, actually, I worked in an aged care facility there too. So I I didn't ever work in a hospital there. So I haven't got that much experience with it but as far as you know like socialized medicine and you know if you're sick you get looked after and you don't pay anything I think New Zealand's very very similar so the way it um, works in Australia with your healthcare is there's a public and a private system and it sounds quite it's quite similar to the English model who were you talking to about that how English how oh Haley Haley yeah oh and Eliza yes yeah yeah, yeah so you know they have the National Health Trust we we have Medicare that funds our public hospitals mm-hmm. And that's like 2% of, of everyone's wage goes into the Medicare. We pay a levy into Medicare and that covers all our, the public hospitals. And then you have an option to have private cover and private hospitals come in there. And that's where I work now. I work in a private hospital in in intensive care. Now, do they pay better in private hospitals? No, or quite the opposite. Oh, they pay worse? Yeah, only a little bit, but no. And they have actually probably worse nurse-patient ratios also. Really? Yeah, yeah. You'd think it would be the other way around, but it's not. Why is that? Because they're, you know, they need to make a profit. Oh, uh, got it. Yeah, okay. The hospital I work for, it's a not a privately run. It's, you know, a church-based private hospital, so they're not so bad with profit margins. But, yeah, and plus there's there's been recently mandated nurse-patient ratios, and that only applies to public hospitals, not private hospitals. Okay. Yeah. There's a big ballot measure in Massachusetts right now about nurse-patient ratios because nurse-patient ratios are only a law in California, and I really don't know enough about the topic to speak on it, but it's a huge, huge political fight in Massachusetts right now. So I guess my question is, is everyone wants to know, because we, all the American nurses were kind of stunned by how poorly the UK nurses get paid. Do you think Australian nurses get paid well? Yeah, I, I was definitely very uh, shocked by what uh, Eliza was saying about what she was getting paid in London. I feel like we were doing okay. Saying how many dollars mean much, but I get paid $40, $40 an hour as a base rate, you know, before penalty rate. And I think you can live. So you said $40 Australian, which yeah. would be like $28 yeah. US. 
which is, I think that's, that's pretty comparable. I would say for an average of, you know, the United States without differentials and, you know, depending on where you're working. Yeah. And oh, so but, you know, maybe, they, maybe a little bit less. You'd be shocked at how much we pay for petrol and food. Yeah, that's true. Petrol is a dollar sixty a litre. So that's, I don't know how much that would be. You, you go per gallon, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of math to be doing it. <laughs> yeah. 7.45 at night <laughs> slash 9.45 in the morning, two seasons away. <laughs> There's a lot of converting going yeah. on in this episode. <laughs> and eating out is a lot more expensive. It's so funny. So I, I work in DC and we have a lot of international patients. And I'll have patients that are with like the World Bank or with embassies and everything. And certain Australian patients, the Australian government decides that U.S. healthcare is so expensive, and it is, it's terribly expensive, that they'll fly their employees back to Australia to um, have procedures done because it's cheaper to do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Which is mind boggling that a flight to Australia plus a procedure is cheaper than having it done here in the States. I'm not surprised, surprised at all. I've seen copies of people's hospital bills in the US. It's just, it's crazy. Things can't, they can't really cost that much, you know? I don't know how they can get away with charging these ridiculous amounts of money for, for procedures. Yeah. Well, yeah, people are making a lot of money off of it, unfortunately. We, you know, I was talking about the our Medicare levy. We pay 2% of our income. Recently, um, it was increased from one5 to 2% because we're funding the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is an exciting new thing for people to access when they've you know, got disabilities and living in the community. So, you know, they'll um, have a little bit more support. Yeah, so that's something I don't know an awful lot about. But, you know, most, most Australians are happy to pay a little bit extra in their tax to... Are they? Well, <laughs> I am. My family are. Yeah. We're all strong supporters of paying tax to get good services, you know. I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. I know a lot of people do. A lot of Americans certainly do not want that. I mean, there are those that, that do. It's kind of a very split thing. But I just I just never know how other countries react to that because in America, people are always, you know, cut taxes, cut taxes, yeah, cut taxes. plenty of Australians are like that yeah. too. But what's the alternative? You get sick and you go broke. You can't pay for your health care. Yeah. So you have to mortgage your house and rip into all your savings. Uh, it just... Yeah, it, it's heart-wrenching yeah. to see people so sick because they can't pay for things. And we see a lot here with the poor populations in the States that a lot of conditions that are preventable or that could have been managed so easily early on are not managed and they become so severe that they're they're life threatening or they're extremely expensive to then go yeah, back people and people can't afford they can't afford their insulin and so they go without it and end up having to have amputations yeah. and kidney failure. It's it's exactly. mental. It's not safe. Yeah. Not cost effective, you know. You look after people in the beginning. Yeah, like you say, when a disease process first starts, you know, treat them well then and you don't end up with huge uh, huge bills further down the track. Yeah. I am not a health economist. I am not someone that's going to spout off that we should have certain systems in the U.S. I, I'm not an expert in this. But the fact that we have people in a developed country that are not getting health care is a disgrace on this nation and doesn't make sense economically because we're letting all of these preventable conditions get out of hand yeah. and we're increasing our costs and people are making money off of the suffering of others. And I think it's yeah. terrible. And on that terrible note, tell me about some stories from your <laughs> your job <laughs> let's <Yeah>. shift gears <laughs> before I get too political <laughs> yeah I don't know I could tell you about my worst <laughs> my worst day of work sure let's talk, let's talk about that <laughs> it's, it's awful <laughs> I'd just come on an afternoon shift and this was when I was working on the med medical ward and I'd had an admission a transfer from the rehab ward um not drug rehab you know physical rehab sure how old were you were you like were you a new nurse uh, Experience? No, it was about 10 years ago. So I was a senior nurse working okay. in a medical ward. And yeah, this lady had been transferred to us because she'd acutely deteriorated in the rehab ward. You know, she was, she'd had a brain tumour oh. and had had an operation and was recovering to a certain extent physically. A young woman, like I think she was about my age at the time. So maybe it was late 30s or so. And with a husband and kids and everything. Anyway, that day she deteriorated very rapidly. Um... And they'd made a made a decision to pink slipper, you know, to make it what do you call it? DNR. 
Do you not resuscitate? DNR, not for, not for resus, yeah. yep. But they still wanted to do any, you know, see what was going on. So we were taking her down to X-ray to have her head scanned. Um, and, and, you know, she was barely conscious, but she was breathing. And I assume, I can't remember now, but she must have had a decent blood pressure and heart rate and everything because I wouldn't have taken her to X-ray if it looked really bad. But anyway, so... We're taking her down to x-ray, her husband and me and an orderly pushing the bed down and we get down to the bottom of the lift and she just dies. She just... Oh, gosh. That was it. She just... She died in, you know, on that way. You know, it's like a less than a five-minute walk. Yeah. And we just got out of the lift and um, about to go into a, like an area where there are plenty of people and and her husband's going, what, you know, what's going on? And I said, oh, we, we have to go back. You know, this isn't good. Yeah. She's died and we just stood at the bottom of the lift looking at each other going, oh, my God, what do we do? And so I just say to the orderly, right, straight back into the lift. And she was, <laughs> he had one to move the bed, had one of those well, bed mover. I call them a gazunder because it goes under the bed. You know the things I mean? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm not laughing at the situation, was... but I'm laughing at your terms. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love that word, gazunda. Anyway, it just seemed so slow. Like Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get her in that lift so quickly and, you know, he's trying to turn it and left and right and to get it into the lift and we're bumping walls and it's going so slow and I'm just like, come on, hurry up. And, yeah, anyway, had to push her in the middle of the afternoon through the public areas with this poor lady was just gone and her husband was just beside himself. Mm. It was so awful. But then... Then I just did the most stupid thing in, it, I've ever done. <laughs> well, possibly not. I've done other stupid things. Sure, I can talk. So we get it back to the ward. <laughs> we get it back to the ward. Our director of nursing was wonderful. She came and helped me, you know, wash her and get her ready to go to the morgue. Never had a director of nursing that's this committed and beautiful as this lady. Oh, that's awesome. She was so wonderful. I mean, how many director of nursing? do that you know come and yeah, help yeah, yeah. on that level so we got her all ready to go to the take her down to the morgue and we had labels that you know the patient labels that you put on the um on the bag mm-hmm. on the body bag that the director of nursing took the patient down for me and when she got down there she realized I'd put the wrong stickers on the patient's body bag which is just so stupid and I was just so embarrassed. You know, she came back up and said, oh, you had the wrong the wrong labels on, you know, because I was so stressed and upset. Yeah, and of course. I just grabbed, I grabbed, what had, what had happened, I'd grabbed her chart and it just had a whole bunch of loose papers in it that were from someone else's chart. It's so, it's so crazy. Which is not your fault. Which That's not your fault. Well, it is. It, 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 that's not my fault that it was put in the wrong chart but what is my fault is not checking the armband with the right. label that I put on the body bag yeah so she comes up and tells me this in the middle of the hallway and I just hit my hand on my head going oh you fucking idiot to the director of nursing yeah. I was calling myself an idiot she was very understanding though she was like it's okay be calm it's all right you've had a rough day yeah so actually what led me to what we used to when we sent people to the morgue, we used to handwrite their details. And the reason I stopped doing the handwritten details of the patient, you know, mm-hmm. name, date of birth, etc., was once I wrote my own details <laughs> on a patient. <laughs> <laughs> And the, it got found out a few days after the people from the um, funeral directors came to pick up the patient and they rang the ward and said, hey, the name on the, the patient's body bag is different to her actual name. And they're like, oh, that's odd. We'll come down and check it out. And the thing that had happened was this patient's name was Alison, you know, yeah. Black or something. Yeah, yeah. And I'd written Alison, my surname, and my date of birth. <laughs> Just because I was just in a total, I mean, I must sound like the biggest idiot. So I sent myself off to the morgue. <laughs> I guess that's one of those just kill me now moments. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we still can have a bit of a joke about that one. There was no harm, no foul. But, yeah, so I can remember writing the label thinking, um, you know, writing Alison and thinking to myself, right, got to do it properly. It's not me. And having to think about it. And then I, I don't know what happened. I was probably distracted, too busy with too many patients and too much going on. And yeah, I fucked up. Mistakes get made. Everybody messes up. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and some serious mistakes get made. Like, you know, talking about when you're talking to Eliza, I think about the pill trolley. Yes. You know, we still don't have pics. Uh, we do. Some hospitals in, a, in Queensland have PIXIS, but we still will have patients with, you know, four or five patient charts, all handwritten, nothing's typed, and, you know, a whole cupboard full of medications that you've got to go through carefully and make sure the order's right and, you know, you've, got to, you've really got to have your wits about you. I'll tell you, I mean, I can tell you a couple of times when I did something stupid, or not even stupid, I just didn't know, you know. <laughs> It's good for people to know yeah, that, you know, it happens. You know, people make mistakes and to own up to it, you know, and not brush it under the carpet. Like, you know, be honest and open about mistakes yes. that get made, whatever. But I really believe that every mistake I've ever made, I reported myself and I don't have a problem with that because it's a, it's a no blame thing. It's a learning thing. It's learning from your mistakes so that you don't yeah. make them again. And other people can learn from mistakes too, so that they're not repeated over and over again. The biggest mistake to make once you have recognized an error is to not tell anyone because then you're perpetuating it. Because as soon as you say something about it, absolutely, and then you go, oh, then everyone recognizes it, then you can correct it. You know, people get sued because errors happen and then, you know, then harm comes because no one's done it. And I'll, I used to tell this all the time when I was training EMTs, talk about the worst day of your job. My worst day was kind of similar. Oh, God, you would have had heaps of worse days than me. <laughs> well, no, this one was, I was a young, a young EMT. <laughs> so this was a young mother. She was 20s, early 20s, maybe. And she had three kids. She was at this like community ER, which was just out outside of Boston. So we, but we had to take her to, take her to Boston. There was a stat transfer because she was so sick. And we were driving the paramedics. So this was before we had portable vents on the ambulances. And so someone had to bag her because she was, she was intubated. She had several lines running. I think she was septic. She had been an IV drug abuser, but her three kids, little kids said goodbye to her in the ER as we were loading her up. Her significant other was there and I was driving. And so it's this tiny old ER and I'm in this big box truck ambulance And all these trucks have been there because it was really busy. And so I'm trying to squeeze through them all. And of course, this woman's really sick. She's loaded up and there's three EMTs and medics in the back. And one paramedic is just a dick. This guy, I will never forgive this guy because he's such an asshole. And if you are ever in a position of any kind of power in medicine, do not be this guy. (laughs) Do not be an asshole. Um, So I scraped the side of the truck as I'm leaving because I'm trying to just not hit the other ambulances. I scrape it on the wall coming around this corner. And this paramedic looks up and goes, Oh geez, what the fuck are you doing? This is how this ride's going to be. So I'm like, God. Oh, great. Great. So dying woman, children, I just met in the back and this guy's being a douchebag. Cool. Let's go to Boston. So driving lights and sirens, trying to just get there because she's, you know, we're, we're breathing for her. There's no yeah. vent. And her, she's on the monitor, but it's sketchy at best. So one of the main bridges to get into Boston at the time was under construction. And I was relatively new to that area. I had been at the company maybe maybe a year, maybe six months, maybe nine months. So like I knew enough of how to get there when everything was going right. And of course, it's nighttime, but the bridge was under construction. And so there was like, you drive ahead straight and you go the way I know how to go, (laughs) or you veer off to the right and you go into a part of Boston that I do not know at all. (laughs) And because of the construction, the straight way, the normal way was blocked and it was a detour that goes right. (sighs) And Boston city streets, if anyone has ever driven there, This part is like all cobblestones. There's one ways. It's really narrow and I'm in a a big box truck. And so I'm driving and I'm like, I I don't know where I'm going. And I started- No Google Maps back then? No, we didn't have GPS. And I mean, GPS existed, but we weren't allowed to have them in the ambulances. And it's nighttime. I can't pull out a map book. So I start to go around. It's this huge, big turn, like a highway off ramp. So I'm starting to go on the turn and I'm just freaking out. Oh my God. It's never because I don't I'm about to go into Boston. I don't know where I am and this woman is so sick and I just met her children. So I I was like, well, I can't fake this. I look in my partner in the back and I go, 
I don't know where I am. I need you to help me. And she was very cool. And she goes, okay, where were you? And what is going on? And I go, there's a detour. I, I don't know. It's dropping me off in this part of Boston. And this is happening really quickly. And of course, douchebag paramedic in the back is going, what the fuck? We're fucking lost. And he just starts swearing at me. He just starts screaming and screaming and screaming at me. And in that second, the woman codes. And the, his medic partner is just like, we don't have a pulse. And she's got so many lines running and she's got all the other 12 lead wires on her that they can't get the pads on her right, right away. Mm. So my partner goes from telling me directions to starting to do CPR. And me- douchebag medic is yelling at me. Other paramedic is bagging her. My partner's trying to do CPR. They're trying to get the pads on. It is just like, it's chaos. And I'm just coming around. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming i'm just coming around the bend of this highway and just shitting my pants and like okay i'm just gonna figure this out <laughs> and thankfully as soon as i come off the bend i see a sign that points towards boston it's, it's a road that i know that the hospital is on and i'm like i, I got it i'm good <laughs> and before they get the pads on i'm like back on the highway on the right road I find some back roads and she gets a perfusing rhythm back and I mean she's not okay but it's yeah. better yeah. <laughs> and so then I get into the ER and I'm just like I'm not a crier okay <sighs> I went through basic training I did not fucking cry once I'm not like an emotional person in that way like I'm a very empathetic person but I'm not a crier I was seconds from tears the entire oh, I would have, time I would have just been bawling right there and then I'm terrible I got out of the truck and of course because we had left our truck at that ER we had to drop the patient off and then ride back with dickhead partner Ugh. dickhead paramedic and his partner and he's just looking at me like just scowling at me the entire time my partner's like are you okay and I'm like yep I'm, f- I'm, f- I'm fine I'm fine don't look at me <laughs> and I'm just like about to lose it. The, oh my God. It was terrible. And and I like very openly tell people that story because ask for help. Yeah. Just ask for help. You have to. You're going to mess up. Like you, there's going to be situations where it's lose, lose. Just it's going to be more lose if you don't ask. Yeah. And don't be a dick. Yes. And also don't be a dick. Yeah. Yeah. When things if you are not helping. <laughs> when I've been in, in arrest, the best thing is like, a leader that is calm and cool it's awful when you've got the doctor there that's getting all cranky and stressed and being rude to people and and rolling their eyes at people you know it's it's not helpful right for anyone you know just keep calm keep cool say thank you yeah you're on the same team yeah absolutely and everyone works together better if you help each other out and be kind yeah so it's hard enough there's no reason to to make it worse yeah Do you have any good stories, any feel-good patients that have, you know, really made nursing worth it for you? I talk about a lot of depressing things on my podcast. It'd be nice to talk about some good things. Uh, Just one of the wonderful things to have watched in my career as a nurse is of some of the wonderful new medications and treatments we have generally. But when I first started nursing, it was the late 80s. And so HIV crisis, AIDS crisis was, we were right in the middle of it. And we had this infectious disease ward that had in the past it had been used for polio polio patients Mm -hmm. patients with golden staff that was the only multi-resistant organism we knew of back then there was no vre or crab or esbls it was just golden staff mrsa that was all we had yeah and actually this ward down in the bowels of the ward it was a really old ancient spooky building but there are heaps of old iron lungs from the polio epidemic oh wow of course, I wasn't nursing during the polio epidemic, but that's um, for the older nurses. That was a, a disease that they had been a big part of their nursing when they were young. And we got rid of it because we got a vaccine, which is wonderful. Yes. But when I was there, it was we had a lot of patients with HIV, full blown AIDS, and it was devastating. You know, mm. they were just so emaciated and had chronic diarrhea and PCP, you know, lung respiratory problems, the um, the skin cancers, I've forgotten what they're called, that they used to commonly get. Oh, um, yes. Car- uh, Carposi sarcoma. That's it. Yeah. So just awful. And plus there was the whole stigma of yeah. HIV positive that people had to battle. 
with. But the wonderful thing is uh, with all the new class of drugs, the antiretrovirals, we don't have wards like that anymore. We don't have to have hospice care for HIV patients. Yeah, no hospice care for young guys anymore. Yeah, yeah. And it's been revolutionary. It's amazing. You know, these people, I can't imagine how many hundreds, thousands of lives have been saved, amazing new drugs. Uh, and what it's done, you know, for um, hep C also. Yeah, Harvoni is the drug now that has been saving a lot of lives. Yeah, they just have to take it for a couple of months, is that right? And then you're cleared yeah, of it's, uh, hep C? I think it's a six month, and don't quote me on this, this is not yeah. a podcast to get medical information. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Please go to up to date or, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Yeah, I, I believe it's a six-month treatment course. I've had patients on it, not prescribed by myself, but by GI or, you know, their um, hepatitis specialist. And they'll have negative RNA levels yep. after a certain amount of time, and their liver enzymes will be completely normal. And it's really amazing. So it's all thanks to amazing medical research and people that are just dedicated to finding better better ways of treating disease. Yeah, I have I have a patient who contracted HIV during the epidemic, the onset of it, and he's an older gentleman now, and he cracks me alive. up. He's still alive, and he comes in, and he is a very exuberant homosexual man, and I adore him, <laughs> and he's he comes in regularly for labs not related to HIV, but... He he always is like, Christine, my doctors, they didn't kill me. They didn't give me those terrible drugs. I get these Canadian drugs now. They're great. And he'll go on about, like, you know, all my friends died. He goes, you don't see any old gay men like me. And he he's just very funny. And But it's true. We lost a whole generation of men. It's so heart-wrenching. But I was having a conversation with a geriatrician about HIV and these antiretrovirals. And we were talking about patients in the nursing homes and assisted livings being on them. And it's becoming something we have to be more aware of in geriatrics because patients that had contracted HIV later in the epidemic, after these new antiretrovirals have been created, they're living this long. Yep. They're on these yep. drugs, and it's such a wonderful problem for us clinicians to have to worry about these drug interactions. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, we didn't have. They're living and they're dying of heart failure. They're, I mean, yeah. they're not they're they're like dying that. of old age. They're dying of old age. They're dying. Not that I'm saying dying of heart failure is a good thing, but they're not dying of AIDS. They're dying of yep. things that old people die of. Exactly. And I have to worry about it interacting with your diltiazem or your amlodipine or your whatever. And just from an epidemiological sense, it's so wonderful <laughs> for me to have that burden. And it's, it's a messed up thing to say, but it's so cool. Yeah. And it gives me so much hope for other diseases that we're fighting. And I say we, yeah. the royal we, as I sit here, not doing any research. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here and taking the time to talk to me it's my pleasure I've, I've, re I've been really enjoying enjoying your podcast so much you know like there's a few podcasts that pop up on my feed and I I'm just like hey, I'll get to it later but yours I always listen to straight away oh thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> well if anyone else is listening anywhere around the world uh let me know where you're listening from because I just think it's really cool and if you have a really interesting job if you're doing something that I haven't talked about if you have some health system that's unique that you think the world should know about or America the United States Korea and Australia and Canada and that guy in Spain let us know <laughs> oh that person in Kazakhstan yeah yeah they want to know you can reach out to us on social media at antidotes podcast that's Facebook and Instagram. Twitter is Antidotes Pod. My Twitter is Christine the NP. And you can always email us at antidotespodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next week. <laughs>